complacency. It's something really easy to fall into. Complacency is something that uh, can sneak up, us, sneak up on us all. We can get used to doing something and we can, get, uh, can do it so much and, or we can uh, take it for granted so much that we just uh, become so complacent about it all. There's a definition that I found on complacency. It says, contented to a fault with oneself or one's actions. Contented to a fault with oneself or one's actions. In other words, uh, the Latin root for that word, and listen, I, I'm a good old boy from Alabama. I have to admit I didn't take Latin, but I trust people who took Latin. Uh, but in Latin, uh, the root of that word complacency means very pleased. And you might think that's a good thing, but it's not always a good thing. See, even though complacent people may be very pleased with themselves, uh, folks who are around them are not very pleased with them usually. You see, even the, they're, they're, the, the complacent people, they're, they're concerned by things that should concern them. They're unconcerned by things that should concern them. And they neglect their duties. They neglect things that they should be paying attention to. I was looking at um, some synonyms for the word complacent. And so, and these are just a few of them that uh, I found. And so, somebody as complacent can also be con defined as being apathetic, disinterested, indifferent, unconcerned, uninterested, half hearted, lukewarm. Someone who is complacent has become overly content. And I couldn't find this video. I saw this video. I wanted to show it to you. It's just a real brief video about this uh, oriental gentleman who is at work. And his job, his job was to, as he was on an assembly line, as it was coming by him, his job were, were to take these little metal things. It looked like mushrooms. That's not what they were, but that's what they looked like. His job was to just take them off the little track as it was coming by and just flip them into a bucket. That was his job. And he was so complacent, so at ease about doing this, that he was doing it with his eyes closed. Just like that, just flipping it into the little basket. There's no challenge. He was overly content. I don't know what happened if he missed one, but during the whole, you know, 15-second video, he didn't miss a single one. So uh, I don't know what happens if he does. But, you know, we can become so complacent. And, and, and complacency can happen in all areas of our lives. It can happen in our work. It can happen in our marriages. It can happen um, in, in, in all areas of our lives. But I think it becomes more evident in specific areas of our lives. I think the easiest place for us to become complacent is in our spiritual lives. It's very easy for us to become so complacent there. It's, it is uh, uh, in our relationship with Jesus Christ, we begin to take so much for granted and we begin to, to just coast and cruise along. I was looking at a survey. This survey uh, was put out by Barna Research, and it was put out in 2015, in December of 2015. And they published this findings on spiritual complacency that, I guess Barna Research is everything, doesn't he? I mean, he, you pretty much ask, you know, is there research about this? And he's got it. But he does this about spiritual complacency. And he surveyed what he called practicing Christians. And this is his definition of a practicing Christian. Practicing Christians are self-identified Christians who say their faith is very important to their lives and who have attended a worship service or other, other than for a special occasion one or more times in the last month. That's his definition of a practicing Christian. Somebody who says their faith is important and they've been to church at least one time in the uh, last month and it wasn't for a wedding or something like that, you know. Well, in his research, he, he says this. He said, despite believing their church em emphasizes spiritual growth, engagement with the practices associated with discipleship leave much to be desired. For example, only 20% of Christian adults are involved in some sort of discipleship activity, some activity to help you grow and help me grow in our faith. Only 20% of practicing Christians are involved in that. 
He said, practicing Christians are more likely to be involved in a variety of spiritual growth activities, yet even among practicing Christians, fewer than half are engaged in these four types of spiritual disciplines, these four types of spiritual growth. And he gave these percentages. For instance, the first one is this. Only, uh, this is practicing Christians. These are people who say that their spiritual life, their spiritual walk is very important to them. Only 43% of those surveys are in a small group or in a growth group. Only 43%. And these folks say it's important to them. Only 33% study the Bible with a group. Only 25% read and discuss a Christian book with a group. And only 17% have a spiritual mentor. And these are folks who say that their faith is important to them and very important in their lives, and yet they have become complacent. So I wonder what's it going to take to get our attention. I'm reminded of a story that I read about a woman who went to the doctor's office with a problem that she was having, and, and uh, whenever she got there, they put her in with a new doctor in the office. And he walked in to see her, and about four minutes into the examination, uh, she comes running out of the examination room, screaming as she ran down the hall, just screaming almost uncontrollably. And an older doctor who had been there for a while and knew her caught her and said, and said hey, what is wrong? And he, they stepped into a different exam room and, and asked her what the problem was, and she told him the story. And he said, wait right here. And she, he walked out of the room. He walked down to find this new doctor that had just spoken with this lady. And, and he looked at him. He said, what is the matter with you? Mrs. Terry is a 63-year-old woman. She has four grown children. She has a whole, but she has seven grandchildren. And you tell her she's pregnant? Without even looking up, the doctor said, well, has she still got hiccups? What's it going to take to get our attention? What's it going to take? This past week, as I was visiting with someone, they, uh, we were talking, and I said, well, you know, yeah, I've got some news. And, and they, said, they looked at me, they said, Anita's pregnant. And I went, ah! Okay, they had my attention. Uh, she's not, by the way. Just, you know, clarify that. What's it going to take to get our attention? Something has got to come along to get our attention when we become too casual in our faith. See, we can take our relationship with Jesus for granted, and we can allow complacency to lead to stagnation. Listen, what happens is, is we, we go from being, you know, on fire and then we kind of, the fire kind of dwindles down to a little ember and we become a little complacent in our faith and that complacency will lead to apathy. That apathy will lead to laziness. That laziness is going to lead to stagnation and then that stagnation is going to lead us in a direction in our spiritual life we don't want to go. See, if we're not careful, we're going to just coast through our faith journey. Have you ever noticed it doesn't take any effort to coast? Most of the time, if you're coasting, you're all going downhill. If you want to get somewhere, you can't just coast through it. You've got to put some effort into it. You've, you've got to put some time into it. See, there, there, you know, <clears throat> there's this church in Revelation, in the book, last book of the, the Bible. You go to this church in Revelation, and this church, is, it was in a town called Laodicea. Laodicea had a problem with complacency. You see, John records that a letter was sent to them warning them of the danger of being complacent. And I want you to notice what John writes to this church in Laodicea. Notice John's words. He says this, I know your deeds that you are neither cold or hot. I wish you were either one or the other. 
So because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. God said, because you can't make up your mind, you're so lukewarm, you make me want to throw up. Laodicea, listen, they were one of the wealthiest cities in first century Israel. They were known for their banking industry. They were known for their manufacturing of wool. They were also known for their medical school that produced this ISAV that helped people out. And the church in Laodicea had become so complacent that they were not only not growing, they were also not representing Christ well in their community, in their city. They couldn't decide to take a stand on anything. As a matter of fact, the writer of Revelation said, you're neither hot or cold. You can't make up your mind. Pick a team. Figure out what you're going to stand for. See, they were just going along to get, in, get along. They were lukewarm. I love going on mission trips, and by the way, we have a mission trip to Guatemala coming up, and if you'd like to be a part of that, we can sure help you out. There's a meeting about it today. I hope you can check that out today. I love going on the mission trip, so I've been on a bunch of them, and, and I was on this one particular trip, with, and I had my two youngest children with me, and uh, we were down in Ecuador, and uh, we had gone to right outside the jungle, in the edge of the jungle in Ecuador, to a place called Shell. Uh, Ecuador, and we were uh, there doing some work, and, and uh, Shell being in the edge of the jungle, you have a lot of missionaries flying in and out of the jungle, some of them living in the jungle with the, uh, the, the native groups that are, live in the jungle. They would go out and literally live with them and minister out in the jungle to them. And so while we were there, our job was to help work on some of the missionaries' homes and some of the missionary uh, organizations and help them so they could continue their ministry. So we were working on a, on a home while we were there uh, in Shell, and, and uh, one of the young men whose families were missionaries there uh, was in out of the jungle. He was at, at, happened to be in town, and he was decided he wanted to help us out. And so he was hanging out with uh, us and helping us paint and work and do all this kind of stuff. And so we go to the store to, you know, I, I carry my kids to the score, store and he goes along with us. And, and we, get, we go to the store and we're going to get a, a snack, kind of take a little break, get a Coke and, and, uh, and then get back at it. So we take him with us and we go over and we get a Coke out of the refrigerator there. And, uh, and he gets one off the shelf. And I'm thinking, you know, I tell him, I say, man, you know, I, I'm buying, you know, get whatever you'd like, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and he grabs that off the shelf, and, and I wonder why he got it off the shelf. And then I found out this. He lived in the jungle with his family, ministering to one of the, the uh, groups that lived in the jungle. They had no refrigeration out there. As a matter of fact, he had grown up with people bringing Cokes out to him, bringing soft drinks out to them, and they would take those and just leave them in their, in their hut without refrigeration. And as a matter of fact, he had gone to the point where he didn't like carbon, the carbonation. He would rather his Coke to be flat. He wanted warm, flat Coke. Have you ever tasted non-carbonated Coke when you thought it was supposed to be carbonated? I don't like warm drinks at all. And his, his desire was to drink a warm, flat Coke. Now, if you look at a warm, flat Coke sitting there, you can't tell the difference if it's just sitting there right by another Coke that's like it should be, cold and, you know, carbonated. So it, it, you, you, you can't tell the difference. They smell the same. They look the same and all that. The difference is in the taste. You see, I've had that warm, flat Coke before, and I just want to spit it out. And if you look, like I said, you can't tell the difference until you get into the Coke. 
See, too often Christ followers, we become so complacent with our relationship with Jesus, we become like that warm, flat Coke. We look okay on the outside. If you're just looking at us, I mean, you, you, can, you can look at us and, and assume everything's okay on the outside, but what we've done is we've become so complacent that we've become flat in our faith. There's no fizz left. So I want us to get our fizz back. And I want to look. I'm just, I mean, there's a lot of areas we can become very complacent, but I'm only going to look at three, okay? Just three where we can become complacent. And one of the areas we can become so complacent is our worship. I'm going to give you my definition of worship. And this is mine. It's on, it should be on your papers that were in your bulletins. But I define worship as the realization that God loves you and you just want to love him back. See, we try to make it too complicated. We realize that God has a love for us. We realize how much he cares for us. And all we want to do is express that love back to him. Our worship, when we worship, is us telling God we love him. We do that through singing. We can do that through, through praying. We do that through reading of the scripture. We do, it, do that through uh, our giving. We do that in all these other areas. Those are all expressions of worship. But worship is simply telling God you love him. See, it's in worship that we not only acknowledge that God loves us, but we express our love through the singing and through the praying and through the giving and through focusing on his word. And while worship, while we can worship God when we are alone, I, I, I do that, and I hope you do that some by yourself too. We can worship God when we are alone. We should have those times of worship that it is not just a, a time when we're by ourselves. We should come together for worship. As a matter of fact, the scripture calls on us to do that. Notice what the writer of Hebrews says. He says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some as are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and, the more, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Whenever we make the choice to stay away from church, we're making a choice to take away one of the means that God uses to help us stay strong in our spiritual life. When we, I'm going to say that again, when we choose to stay away from worship, we are, te we, are not, we are not allowing God to use one of the tools he has to help us stay strong in our walk. See, we not only need worship, uh, need to worship God, but we also need to gather for worship because we help each other. We can lean on each other during worship. We can learn from each other during worship. We can cry together during worship. We can laugh together during worship. We can celebrate. We can mourn. We can do all of that. And when we come together, we realize that what we're going through is not something new. Other people have gone through it too. See, when we gather together, we come for the common purpose of acknowledging that God loves us. And so we can collectively tell him how much we love him. We share our faith together. We strengthen each other. I want to ask you something. Just kind of do a little spiritual gut check here. Do a little spiritual soul searching. Have you ever thought that when you choose to stay away from worship on Sunday morning, that you're not only hurting yourself and your family, but you're also denying others the opportunity to learn and grow from you and you to learn and grow from them? I want you to think about it. You know, y'all have heard me say before, we all have our own assigned seats in church. They're self-assigned. 
you know, I get that. And it's, it's cool. It's good. I, I don't mind. I can look around, you know, and say, okay, I see who's not here. All right. Uh, <laughs> and when you move on me, you freak me out. I'm just here to tell you. Well, we have our, and so we, we're creatures of habit. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, nobody here walks up and says, hey, you're in my seat. You know, nobody does that kind of stuff. But, you know, but we, we're creatures of habit. We're going to sit in the same kind of, same area usually. And guess what? If we're doing that, guess who else is doing that? The other folks sitting around us. So my question for us is, whenever we're here in worship, are we noticing who's in our zone? Are we noticing who is there? Or more importantly, are we noticing who's not there? Are we willing to take a few moments out of and, 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 and look at those folks within three or four rows of us in our zone? And are we willing to speak to them? Are we willing to, to express to them that, you know, just to say hi? And, and you may go over to them and say, hey, I, you know, you look like you're new here. No, I've been a member here for 15 years. Well, hey, I've never met you. It's all good. It's okay. Have you ever thought about letting folks know that you miss them? Listen, you can know when you're becoming complacent in worship when you start missing the services and you become okay with that. Contrary to what people may think, I don't come to church because I'm the preacher. I come to church when I don't preach. I'll go off on vacation and I'm going to find a way to worship. We were camping one time and the campground had a, had a, a service that met at, at the little pavilion. And, and uh, you know, we, I, I go to the, to the little pavilion. I leave our camper and I go over to the little pavilion and, and I'm waiting. And eventually a few people show up and somebody comes and they share the word. And we worship right there in our bathing suits in the little pavilion at a campground. Listen, if you, if you have trouble making it to church regularly, and, and listen, if you, if you read anything into what I'm saying besides the fact that you need to be in worship, you're not listening. It has nothing to do with numbers. It has nothing to do with anything else except your spiritual growth and how you can help others. But if you're having trouble making it to church regularly, I, I would suggest that you search your heart and your life and ask yourself, what is hindering you from coming to church? Is attending worship important to you, or is it something you do when you can fit it into your schedule? I mean, I know you're here today, and I'm very thankful. I want you to think about the last few times you missed a service on Sunday morning. What kept you away? Was it a real reason or a lame excuse? What could possibly be more important than worshiping on a Sunday morning? See, you're also going to notice, you, you also know that you're becoming complacent in worship when you come to the service expecting to find something to complain about. I'm not saying anybody here does that. I'm just saying anybody that goes to a church can find something to complain about. Listen, you can always find something to complain about. I've heard me preach. And this may shock you, but I actually know what I'm going to say before I say it. I spend a little time checking it out. I know it's easy to find something to complain about. I mean, I know that not everybody likes the same songs. I know that some don't like to hear any mention of money. Don't talk about dollars, you know, here. I know that there is always something someone can find to complain about if that's what you're looking for. Listen, we evaluate the service on Sunday morning, uh, Monday mornings. When we meet together as a staff, we're talking about how did it go? What can we do better? So evaluating, there's nothing wrong with that. We do that all the time. We not only evaluate the worship service as a staff, we evaluate everything we do around here. 
Everything gets evaluated. There's nothing wrong with evaluating, but there's a difference between evaluating and complaining. See, if you're always looking for something to complain about, then honestly, you're probably not here to worship. You're here to gripe. And you've lost your focus of worship. See, it's not about the music. It's not about the songs. It's not about whether or not you wear a tie or not. It's, it's, it's not about anything else. It's not about a preaching style. I know I preach different than every other preacher out there. Some are very quiet. I've never been very quiet. I wasn't very quiet as a baby. I was born crying. The doctor said, I'm still going to pop his little tail because I pop everybody's little tail. I mean, you know, I, he didn't have to do that to get me to cry. I was, I was, I've always been loud. It's not about the preaching style. It's, about, it's not even about who's preaching. See, our focus should be on God. And I will tell you this. If you show up on Sunday morning and expect to meet God, you will. And if you show up on Sunday morning not expecting to meet God, you won't. He'll be here, but your focus will be in the wrong place. I'm just going to throw this in. I said I usually know what I'm going to say. This is a bonus, all right? <laughs> every Sunday, every Sunday, I offer the plan of salvation every Sunday. That has been a conviction of mine since my very first sermon. My very first sermon was the what, the how, and the when of Christianity. And during that time, I told them what a Christian is, how do you become a Christian, and when you should do it. And ever since then, I've been offering the plan of salvation every single Sunday that I've preached. And every Sunday, I expect somebody to be saved. Not because I offer the plan of salvation, but because people are walking in these doors needing to know about the love of Jesus Christ and needing to know that He loves them and needing a relationship with Him. And every Sunday, I expect somebody to be saved. Does somebody come up and talk to me about it every Sunday? No. Do I have a running tally in my office of who, who made it and who didn't this week? No. No. But I arrive here with the expectation somebody needs to hear about Jesus and I offer them the opportunity to know him. What do you expect when you get here? What priority does worship have in your life? Second thing is work. I'm not talking about your vocation. I'm not talking about your nine to five that you get paid for. I, I'm talking about the work that God has called Woodbine to be a part of in this community. You know, I'm very thankful for all those who make the choice to serve in a multitude of ministries that we have here and in the outreach that God has called on Woodbine to do in our area. I'm so thankful for that. Without volunteers working so hard, we couldn't do what we do. Listen, you can't hire and pay Enough people to do what you do when you volunteer. You can't do it. We have hundreds and hundreds of people who volunteer throughout the year to serve. And without volunteers working so hard, we would not be able to accomplish all that we are supposed to do to tell people about Jesus Christ. But I will tell you this, we can use more volunteers. See, for most of my ministry, I've heard what has been called the 80-20 rule. Have you all ever heard of that? Basically, the 80-20 rule is 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people. That means 20% of the, 80% of the people only do 20% of the work, I guess. I'm thankful as a look around that we have a lot of folks who are volunteering in a lot of areas, way more than 20%. I'm thankful that when we get ready for vacation Bible school, we, we're going to have over 200 kids, but we're going to have over 100 volunteers. You 
You know, that's great. But my question is, do we become complacent in our work and our ministry that we are a part of? I understand that there are those who choose not to serve in the different ministries of the church. And, 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 I, and I get that. And they may call it something else when they choose not to serve. But I believe the main reason people choose not to volunteer is they don't see the value and the importance of what the church is doing. Or either they think that their help is not needed or it's not valuable. And that's not true. See, I believe that the main reason that people do not volunteer to serve in ministries at the church, it has to do with complacency. Everyone likes to think somebody else is going to do it. And because they think somebody else is going to do it, they're going to choose to let somebody else do it. See, their complacency leads to a lack of serving. And, and that's not the model Jesus had for us. Notice what Jesus said. He said these words. Mark records these words. Matthew, Matthew and John record the same words. But I'm going to read from Mark. Mark says this. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came to serve other people. And if you want to be more like Jesus, serve. See, I can't remember any passage in the Bible. And I'll throw you a challenge. I gave you a challenge last week. I'm going to give you a challenge this week. I'm going to challenge you to find me a passage in the Bible where Jesus only focused on taking care of himself. You're not going to have to look very far. Only look in the first four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There are only four of the 66 books that are there. Just, uh, you know, I mean, 69 books that are there, or however many books that are there. And, you know... Uh, if you will just take time to read those four and find one place where Jesus focused on himself. If you look all throughout the four Gospels, Jesus was constantly spending his life in service to other people. He was teaching, he was healing, he was preaching, he was feeding, he was comforting, he was challenging, he was loving. Everything Jesus did was for other people. Jesus did not run away from those who were in need. He ran to those who were in need. And the very reason, listen, the very reason Jesus came to this earth was for you. The very reason the reason he left heaven was for you. The only reason he went to the cross was for you. The only reason he died was for you. And the only reason he rose from the dead was for you. See, there's very little chance that any of us in our room are going to be called to die for our faith. But Jesus did say we're supposed to live out our faith in service to other people. As a matter of fact, he says this, again in John, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Next week, we're going to have a Servants for Christ Expo out here. And our, that expo is basically very simple. It gives you a whole host of places you can volunteer and do and be a part of ministry here in this church. You can have a chance to check out everything. I want you to know you're going to see a lot of things, but it's not an exhaustive list. I want to encourage you to not allow complacency to keep you from the blessing of serving. There's something for everybody. The last thing is this. We become, we become complacent in our witness. I'm convinced that the only reason pe that people don't tell other people about Jesus is because they don't care about him. Complacency robs us of the joy of telling others about the greatest love that they could ever experience. 
See, I don't know how many times I, I've either preached an, an entire sermon or, or mentioned in a sermon the importance of telling other people about Jesus. Jesus said, this is the most important thing we have to do. I love John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. He said this. He, says, you, he told his preachers, you have, there, you have nothing else to do but save souls. What he was saying is everything that flows out of what you do, everything that flows out of your ministry flows out of the fact that your primary work as a minister of the gospel is to save souls. And our primary responsibility as Christ followers is to tell other people about the Christ we follow. I've shared with you this story before, but I want to share it again about D.L. Moody. He had a conversation with a woman, and the woman says, Mr. Moody, I don't like the way... D.L. Moody was an evangelist and, and a preacher. He went all over the world telling people about Jesus. He would, he would go and he'd preach at a, at a, uh, a, a revival meeting, and, and he'd leave that revival meeting, and then you know what he'd do? He'd go to the bar. You know why he'd go to the bar? Because those folks hadn't been to the revival. And he'd tell them about Jesus. This woman one time came up to D.L. Moody and says, Mr. Moody, I don't like the way you win people to the Lord. Mr. Moody looked back at, her, back at her and says, well, I don't like it either. How do you do it? And she said, well, I don't win people to the Lord. And he said, well, I like my way better. I just want to be real honest with us today. Listen, sharing Jesus with others does not have anything to do with ability. It has everything to do with desire. See, some people believe that their testimony is not very exciting or very powerful. Some people believe that their testimony will not be effective or that people won't want to hear what they have to say. You need to change your way of thinking about your testimony because your testimony is just that. It is your testimony. God has not called on us to share other people's testimony. He's called on us to share our testimony. He's called on us to share what God has done in our life life see if you're worried about how powerful or exciting your testimony is then you're focusing on the wrong thing Listen, don't miss this. Your testimony is not about what you have done for God. Your testimony is about what God has done for you. See, there are so many people who would benefit from you telling them what God has done and is doing in your life. They want to hear from you. They want to hear about what God has ha what's happened in your life. They want to hear how God has blessed you. They want to hear why you love Jesus so much. They want to hear from you. Listen, don't miss this. I want to say it again. Your testimony is not about what you've done for God. Your testimony is about what God has done for you. There are so many who need to hear that. Sharing our faith is not about winning an argument. It's not about trying to prove someone is worse than us. Sharing our faith is about telling people how much Jesus loves them and not about how much they should feel guilty. John wrote this in 1 John. He says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Do you love other people enough to tell them about the love Jesus has for them? Will you pray with me? Father, I found in my own life how 
very simple it is to become complacent. I found in my own life how very simple it is to just kind of coast. I found in my own walk how I can, you know, just take so much of my walk for granted and I can, uh, my worship is affected by that, my time with you is affected by that, my witness is affected by that, my service for you is affected by that. Complacency just is a, it's like a disease that infects everything. But the thing about it, Father, is we, we don't have to stay complacent. We don't have to stay focused only on what, you know, just cruising and coasting. We can have that fire rekindled in us. Father, there may be some within the sound of my voice right now that have just been, uh, Father, they've been pushing you away and they've been complacent about even having a relationship with you, they, they have just been kind of taking for granted that they'll always be here and so will you. Maybe right now, Father, they need to stop being complacent. They, they need to begin a relationship with you, Father. If that's who you are, if you want to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ, I can help you right now. And I want to just invite you to pray this very simple prayer just between you and God. And I'm going to say it and you just repeat it after your, in your own words just between you and Him. And you can remember this prayer with these four words. The first word is sorry. God, I'm sorry for what I've done wrong. I'm sorry for the sin in my life. I'm sorry I've rejected you up to this point in my life. The next word is please, please forgive me of my sins. Please come into my life and save me and please become the Lord of my life. And the last two words are thank you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for being there for me and not giving up on me. Thank you for becoming my Lord and my Savior. Father, for those who have prayed that prayer for the first time today in minute, I pray that you would help them in their walk with you. Help them to grow. Help the fire to be kindled in them and the excitement to remain in them. And help their focus to be on how much you love them and how they can love you back. For others of us who are Christ followers and we may have become very complacent in our walk, we, we, we're just coasting, Father. We're, we're not putting any effort into it. We're just, just coasting. We've come, become complacent in our witness and complacent in our work and complacent in our worship. I pray, Father, that that fire would, would be rekindled in us today. That excitement would burn in us again. And we tell other people about how much you love them.